So this, today we're going to continue the series on Satan and, and demons. So we're going to close it up this week. And I'm going to speed it up a little bit just because, you know, we spend ample time praying and ministering to each other through prayer. But demons are evil angels who sinned against God and who now continually work evil in this world. So that demons are evil angels who sinned against God and now continually work evil in this world. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 4, it tells us how they fell and what happened. It says, if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but send them to hell, putting them into gloomy dungeons to be held for judgment. So their habitation now is in hell. Not that they're stuck there, but that's where they dwell, in hell. And then they move around on the earth to destroy humanity. Jude, chapter 1, verse 6, again reiterating the same thing. And the angels who did not keep their position of authority, they wanted more. It wasn't enough that they had a position of authority but abandoned their own home, which was heaven. These he has kept in darkness, bound with everlasting chains. Now that's metaphorically. There's no demons and chains in hell. You see they're roaming around, and we're going to see as we read through scriptures how Jesus dealt with demonic forces. For judgment on the great day. So those two verses, 2 Peter 2, uh, 4, and Jude 1, verse 6, tells us that angels who sin, God cast them down, and now they became demons. So we're going to see Jesus' authority over demons. In his ministry, he encountered demonic forces. So I'm just going to read these passages with not a lot of explanation or not a lot of detailed exposition because of the time. So Matthew chapter 4, verse 24, you can just write these down and then look at them at home. It says, news about spread all over Syria, and people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases. Those suffering severe pain, the demon possessed, those having seizures, and the paralyzed, and he healed them. So we see that Jesus dealt with demonic spirits, and he drove them out of people. Matthew chapter 8, verse 16. When evening came, many who were demon possessed were brought to him, and he drove out the spirits with a word and healed all the sick. Matthew chapter 8, verse 28 and 29. When he arrived at the other side in the region of the Galileans, two demon-possessed men coming from the tombs met him. They were so violent that no one could pass that way. Verse 29. What do you want with a son of God? Does every demon know who Jesus is? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. What do you want with a son of God? They shouted. Have you come, listen to this, have you come here to torture us before the appointed time? Do they know they're going to be tortured in the lake of fire? Absolutely. But what they were asking was, are you doing it now? Is this the time? So every demon in hell knows who Jesus is. They don't have no doubts about it. They know that he's, he was God manifested in the flesh. They know all that. So we see that they think and they rationalize. They have knowledge. So it's not, you know, demon spirits that are not personalities. That they're, they're not impersonal beings. They're personal beings that have a mind, will, and emotion. Have you come here to torture us before the appointed time? And then we go down to Matthew chapter 9, verse 32 and 33. When they were going out, a man who was demon-possessed and could not talk was brought to Jesus. When the demon was driven out, the man who had been mute spoke. The crowd was amazed and said, nothing like this has ever been seen in Israel. Now, this does not mean that every person who's mute has a demon. We cannot make generalizations. It's just in this specific instance, this demon has caused this person not to be able to speak. When we read the scriptures, we can't generalize everything. You know, so we got to make sure that uh, scripture interprets scripture. And then Matthew chapter 17, verse 18 and 20, Jesus rebuked the demon. Now, this, this was the little boy. And it came out of the boy, and he healed him from that moment. But then the disciples came to Jesus in private and asked, why couldn't we drive it out? <laughs> He replied, because you have so little faith. 
which tells us that the disciples were not prepared spiritually to be casting out demons. At that time, they didn't pray, they didn't fast, they were even accused of eating and drinking all the time. They said, what's wrong with your disciples? They eat and drink. And the disciples of, of John the Baptist and the Pharisees were fasting. Your disciples only eat and eat and drink. A lot of times in many churches, that's all that happens as well. You got to take time to fast. So at this time, they were not ready to deal with this demonic spirit. But Jesus told them, because you have so little faith. So our faith has to, has to do with casting out demons. I tell you the truth, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. And then verse 21, some translations add, however, this kind does not come out except with prayer and fasting. So a man and a woman that lives a lifestyle of prayer and occasionally fast, they're prepared spiritually to deal with demonic forces. They are filled with the Spirit of God. They're empowered by God's Spirit to be able to speak to that demon and command them to leave in Jesus' name. At this time, the apostles were not doing that. They were not ready with this particular uh, demon. Luke chapter 4, verse 33 and 35. In the synagogue, or we can translate that, in church, there was a man possessed by a demon, an evil spirit. So it's the same thing. A demon or evil spirit is the same thing. He cried out at the top of his voice, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Every demon acknowledges who Jesus is. And as he was preaching in that synagogue, that man with the demon began to speak through him. And he said, We know who you are, the Holy One of God. Are you here to destroy us? They know that they're one day eventually going to be destroyed. They thought it was at this moment. That's why they asked the question, is it th is at this time now? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. So demons know that Christ was God manifest in the flesh. They know the deity of Christ. Now, if they know that, well, they try to prevent people from believing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. They know that salvation is only through the person and work of Jesus Christ. They know that. We, as you read the Gospels, I'm only reading a few scriptures. There's so much scriptures that talk about his confrontation with demon spirits, but they know that. So they're going to try everything in their power to try to hinder people from believing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And Jesus told them, be quiet, come out of him, the demon threw the man down before them all and came out without injuring him. So now we're going to see that was Jesus' authority over demons. Now we're going to see that he gave the 12 apostles authority to drive out demons. So Jesus had the authority. The 12 apostles have the authority. In Luke chapter 9, verse 1 and 2, when Jesus had called the 12 together, he gave them power and authority to drive out all demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Now, I want you to know that he gave them the power to drive out demons. But once Jesus resurrected from the dead, now they had to pray. They had to fast on their own. It's easy hanging out and eating and drinking and going to Jesus. Give me that power. So he kind of transferred his power to them. And a lot of times we want people to do for us what we need to do for ourselves. At this time, to put it, you know, in street words, they were freeloading off of Jesus' power. They didn't have to do anything. There was a banquet. They ate and drank, turned water into wine, feasting. Jesus sent them out, gave them the power. We didn't need, they didn't need to pray. They didn't need to fast. They didn't need to be in the Word. Jesus, give me your power, and I'll go out. But when Jesus resurrected, all that changed. They realized we need to be in prayer. We need to be fasting. We need to be in the Word. So he sent them out, and they drove out a lot of demons. So he sends out the 12, but now Jesus sends out 72 disciples and gives them authority to drive out demons. So first him, then he says 12, then 72 is increasing. It says in Luke chapter 10, verse 1, After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. And in verse 17, they went. Then the 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, 
Even the demons submit to us in your name. They listen to us because of your name. Jesus replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions from all the power of the enemy. Nothing, sh nothing sh will harm you. Listen to this. However, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. In other words, don't get prideful that you have the authority to cast out demons because then the anointing of God will not flow through them anymore. He said, don't rejoice because of that, but rejoice because your names are written in heaven. They were ecstatic that when they lay hands on people and they say, I command you to leave in Jesus' name, demons left people's bodies. So he sends out the, tw uh, the 72, and that's also for us too. I recommend that you memorize Luke chapter 10, verse 19. I have given you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Every believer has power over the enemy. So now Jesus gives all believers authority to drive out demons. We're going to see in Acts chapter 5, verse 16, it says, Crowds gathered also from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented by evil spirit, and all of them were healed. So we see in the early church, people that were demonized, he brought them to the church, and the apostles laid hands on them. And now we see Philip, who was a deacon. Philip was a deacon. He's not called an evangelist until all the way in uh, Acts chapter 20. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed Christ there. Acts chapter 8, verse 5 through 8. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the miraculous signs he did, they all paid close attention to what he said. With shrieks, evil spirits came out of many, and many par paralytics and cripples were healed. So there was great joy in that city. So even Philip, who was a deacon, serving uh, food, you know, with the seven, he goes to Samaria, starts proclaiming Christ. All of a sudden, demons get manifested, and they start screaming out of people and, and coming out of people. And that's what happens when we proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we're not supposed to be uh, demon hunting. There's some people that everything's a demon, you know? And we're going to go through that uh, in a little while. But when you preach the gospel, if there's a manifestation, then you deal with it. Notice how Philip didn't go to Samaria to cast out demons. He went what? To preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And as he preached the gospel of Jesus Christ, demons starts getting stirred up. That's why in the public schools, you can talk about everybody else, Muhammad, Hare Krishna, Islam, all these different religions. But if you mention Jesus Christ, the devil says, wait a minute, there's power in that name. Everybody else is included except the believer in Jesus Christ. Because every other name does nothing to the devil. He laughs at it. They're operating under him anyway. But when you mention the name of Jesus Christ, in my name you shall cast out demons. They get stirred up. So I encourage as you pre uh, preach the gospel with your friends and family members, and you notice something, you know, that, that they get stirred up, remember that it might be a demon spirit. Not all the time, but it might be. And that's why... They're trying to cancel the Christian church and the Christian community because Satan hates that name. He knows him. Every demon knows who Jesus is. You can talk about anything, the most nonsense thing in the world. But when it comes to Jesus Christ and him crucified, the devil gets stirred up. So here he went to preach. The devil got stirred up, and many demons were cast out. And then Paul talks about Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11 through 12. Put on the full armor of God so you can take a stand against the devil's schemes for our struggles, not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realm. And then 2 Corinthians 10, verse 3 and 5, for though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight, we fight, we fight, or we should be fighting. The weapons we fight we are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedience to Christ. And then 1 John chapter 4, verse 4, 
We quoted this morning, he who lives inside of you is greater than the devil who is in the world. Every believer has authority over the devil and over demon spirit. You don't have to be afraid of them. You don't have to be paranoid of them. The power of God in you is greater than any power of the enemy. He has no control over the believer. As long as we're walking right with God, because sin opens the door to the enemy, you can give him a foothold, according to Ephesians chapter 4. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down when you are still angry. And don't give the devil an opportunity of foothold. So we see that anger, and going to bed angry, and waking up angry, that you give the devil a foothold, and he'll start giving you all types of suggestions of what you should do to get back at that person. And the most crazy things can come to your mind, so... Those are just scriptures, very quickly. We didn't have time to go. But now I want to talk about practically. What is the link between false gods and demonic forces? The link between false gods or idols and demonic forces. So the people of Israel in the Old Testament often sinned by serving false gods. And when we realize that these false gods were really demonic forces, listen to these scriptures, Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 16 and 17. Israel fell into the trap of worshiping the idols that the nations around them were worshiping. Instead of being alive, instead of pointing people to Yahweh, they adopted the, the customs and the culture of the world, and they began doing the same thing the world was doing. God had called them to be different, to be distinct, to be a testimony of who God was, but they got assimilated into the culture. And when they get assimilated into a culture, eventually they got driven out of their land. And the same thing applies to the church today. Instead of us influencing the culture, which we should, we should not allow the culture to influence us. That now we want to be like the culture, we want to be the cool church and the cool Christians and, you know, everything the world accepts, we accept. You know, we want to be inclusive. And by that, what they mean is everybody's included. Nobody has to repent of their sins or turn to God. God includes everybody in their sin, and God does not require anybody to repent or change. That's what they mean by being inclusive. But those that claim to be inclusive will exclude the believer. So you include as long as you're one of them. But if you don't believe like them, you're not included. So we're going to see Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 16 and 17, talking about the children of Israel. They made him jealous with their foreign gods and angered him with their detestable idols. Foreign gods, idols. Verse 17, they sacrificed to demons which are not God. Gods they have not known. Gods that recently appeared. God, your fathers did not fear. So they were not only worshiping idols and bowing down to them. In the background, what they were doing was actually sacrificing to demon spirits. They got involved in demonology. After knowing the true God, how are you going to bow down in front of a statue? Following the customs of the world. And now in Psalm chapter 106, verse 35 to 37, Again, talking about the Israelites. But, but they mingled with the nations and adopted their customs. They mingled with the nations and adopted their customs. We need to be the salt of the earth. We need to be the light of the world. But never, ever adopt their customs. Our values come from the kingdom of heaven. Our principles come from the infallible and immutable word of God, not from the culture. They adopted their customs, listen to this, they worshiped their idols, which became a snare to them. They sacrificed their sons and their daughters to demons. Do you imagine the Israelites, after God brought them out of Egypt, seeing the miracles with Moses and parting the Red Sea, manna from heaven, and now they're sacrificing their sons and daughters to this idol? And the Bible gives us revelation. They were actually sacrificing to demons. Demon worship. This is why Paul can say to the false religions of the first century world, that the first century they had temples for everything. You know, the, the temple of Artemis. You know, the, the goddess of love and, and courage. They had a temple there, you know. 
and they had uh, the temple prostitutes, all these different things. But Paul can say this in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 20. But the sacrifices of pagans are offered to demons, not to God. I do not want you to be participants with demons. Do we agree with that? Don't participate with that. But they offer the pagans in their idols and their temples. They think it's a statue of life. But the Bible gives us revelation. is demon worship. You know, Satan wants to be worshipped. Satan wants to be a mind. Remember, we got through the past two weeks. He wanted to be like God. So he, he wants worship. So he tells them they sacrifice them to demons and not to God. So all the nations around Israel that practice idol worship were engaging in the worship of demons. So when you read the Old Testament and you see they worship Baal and Asherah poles and all these different false gods, they're actually worshiping demons. That's what the scriptures teach us. And anyone else in today's culture who has idols and is worshiping them and all that, they're not just a bowing down before a statue. There's demonic worship that goes on. They might not know it, but that's what happens. That's why uh, the Apostle John said in 1 John, little children, keep yourselves from idols. Stay away from that, because that involves demonic spirits. So certain things about demons, practical things. Demons do not know the future, nor can they read your mind. So some people, I don't want to say, you know, they think that that will read their mind and know the future. Daniel chapter 2, verse 27 and 28. Daniel replied, remember when the king had that dream and he wanted to kill everybody? He told the magicians and enchanters, tell me the, I'm going to tell, tell me the interpretation, the dream and the interpretation. The magician says, no, tell us the dream, and then we'll tell you the interpretation. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, no, you guys think you're slick. I'll tell you the dream, and then you make something up. You tell me the dream and the interpretation to see if you really are good enchanters. And Daniel replied, Daniel chapter 2, verse 27, there are no wise men, enchanters, magicians, or fortune tellers who can reveal the king's secret. If the devil knew the future, wouldn't he reveal it? Or if he could read Nebuchadnezzar's mind, don't you think he will reveal it to these enchanters for them to get the glory and all that? But they didn't know the future. And then, verse 28, but there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets. And then Isaiah chapter 46, verse 9 and 10, remember the things I have done in the past. For I alone am God, I am God, and there is none like me. Only I can tell you the future before it even happens. Only God can do that. Everything is everything I plan will come to pass. For I do whatever I wish. So psychics and fortune tellers, they don't know the future. What they can tell you is what's going on in your life because they can make certain uh, uh, predictions based on observations or they can observe your life, right? So if somebody goes to a fortune teller and they tell them, well, what did I have for breakfast? They can tell them what they have for breakfast because they saw them eating breakfast. Right? They move around, they see. They can tell them the conversation they had last week with that person. How can they tell what conversation you had last week with somebody had that went to a psychic or a fortune teller where they heard the conversation? They observe everything. They, they watch. They see. They hear. So psychics can only tell that. They can't tell them the future because the devil doesn't know the future. Only God knows the future. What happens is people get addicted to these things because they tell them some things that no one else knows. When you were seven, this happened to you, this, this, and that. Is the devil, does demons know that knowledge? Can they know that knowledge? They're not in hell burning right now. That's where they live and they move around. But they move around. They see people, what they're eating and they hearing conversations and all that, but they cannot read your mind. And they can't tell the future. Only God can read your mind. And we saw Jesus when he was on the earth. You know, he, he called Nathaniel and said, before he was standing on the fig tree, I saw you. He knew it. He predicted his own death. We're going to Jerusalem. The Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of men. They will crucify him and bury him. On the third day, he will rise again. Only God knows the future. No demon can read your mind. Or, or, no, or, or know the future. So not all evil is from Satan or demons, but some is. Because some people blame everybody on the devil. Everything is a demon, which frees them from what? Responsibilities. 
I'm going to give you some scriptures to see how Paul dealt with problems in the church. For example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10, when there was a problem of dissension, Paul does not tell the church to rebuke the spirit of dissension, but simply urges them to, to agree and be united in the same mind and in the same judgment. So if there's dissension, Paul didn't say, you know what, rebuke that demon of dissension. No, he tells them, you guys got to agree with the same mind and the same judgment. You guys got to get it together. He didn't blame it on the devil or demon. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, when there was a problem of incest, he does not tell the Corinthians to rebuke the spirit of incest. Right? Because everything's a spirit for some people. But tells them that they ought to be outraged and that they should exercise church discipline until the offender repents. Exercise church discipline. Excommunicate that brother out of the church. That's what they did. And then 2 Corinthians, he repented. But he didn't tell him, rebuke the, the, the demon of incest. He put it right where it belongs. That person was responsible for his actions. When there was a problem of Christians going to court to sue one another, again, 1 Corinthians 6, verse 1 to 8, big problem. Now, Corinth, that church of Corinth had, had the most problems in all the New Testament churches. Paul wrote two letters to them. So when they were suing each other, Paul does not command them to cast out the spirit of litigation or selfishness or strife, but simply tells them to settle those cases within the church and to be willing to give up their own self interest. Again, Paul is not, that's a demon, get it off. Stop suing each other, the demon of suing, get them out in Jesus. The people are responsible. Cut this out. Knock it off. Take responsibility for your behavior. Because it's easy to blame the, the demon for, for things that are going on in your life. And some of it is, but a lot of it is not. A lot of it has to do with people's free will. And that's why whenever you're dealing with somebody that is struggling with, with a demonic influence, you got to ask them, do you want this thing out of your life? They might not want it. you got to learn that. I have to learn it the hard way. Then I might not be willing to give that up. And you might... You might be more anxious to help them give it up than they themselves. Because they know after you pray for them, they're going to go right back to it. They have no intention of repenting or, or, or giving it up. So you got to ask, because if not, you're going to pray for them. And then it happens when it says in Matthew chapter 12, verse 43, when an evil spirit comes out of a person, he goes to dry places, seek and rest. He finds none. He says, I'm going to return back to the house where I came. He takes one of them seven other spirits, more wicked than himself, and they go into that person, and the final condition of that person is worse than the first. So you got to ask the person, do you want to be free from this? They have to be willing. That is the key. Willing, willing, willing. Because a lot of times you'll find yourself overextending yourself and wasting a lot of strength and energy and oil with people that just don't want the help. They enjoy their sin. Now, when they hit rock bottom and they say, you know what? I want to change. Will you fast with me? Will you pray with me? Show me what I need to do. I want to get this thing out of my life. Then you can help that person. So we see through the last of Paul, even when there was this order in the Lord's Supper, they were eating before one another. They were not waiting for each other and all that. Again, Paul did not say, Corinthians, cast out the demon of disorder. He told them, cut it out. You can wait for each other. You don't have to eat before the other person. Wait for communion. Don't be embarrassing your brother by eating first and taking the things of the Lord in an unworthy manner. He addressed them. And I want to drive this point home because... For us to understand that a lot of it has to do with people's free will. Right? You try to minister to somebody and help them, and you wonder why they don't want it, and this and that. Does it mean maybe it's a demon causing them and all that? Yes, there might be some demonic influence, but ultimately, they have a free will. Because if they're willing to repent and turn from that, God will set them free. God has no problem with setting anybody free. That's, that's the least thing. Are the, person, are the people willing? So we see in these four examples that not everything's a demon of incest, a demon of disorder, a demon of dissension, a demon of suing each other, none of that. Paul said, you guys, cut it out and deal with it.
their own free will. Stop being, you know, argumentative. Stop disagreeing. Come together. Agree with one another. So not everything, like I said, is a demon. Some is. We don't want to give him more glory than he, he, he shouldn't even have. But sometimes, you know, everything's a devil, the demon, and he's getting all this credit. And meanwhile, it's the person himself. And blame me, you know, the devil made me do this, it's hard, and this and that, I'm struggling with this and that. And some people do struggle, but if they don't want the help, we're not going to be able to help. Even Jesus was not able to help people who didn't want it. When he told the blind, when he looked at the blind man, he looked at him and says, what do you want me to do for you? To see what he wanted. That I may receive my sight. Do you believe I'm able to do this? Are you willing? And they said, go and sin no more. Or a worse thing is going to happen to you. But it's not magic that people get healed and now they can go sin and go clubbing and all that. Sin no more. Not sin some more. Or something worse is going to happen. So Jesus' power to heal and to deliver a drug addict, a prostitute, a homosexual, a lesbian. That is easy for God. In a snap, in a, in a nanosecond, God can set somebody free that is willing, that wants freedom. But if they don't want it, they're just going through the motions and all these different things. And I had a friend who used to work in Arms Acres, which is a drug program, and people were mandated there by the court. Some of them, uh, uh, most of them were, but some of them went on their own free will. He said, the biggest problems I have is those that are forced to go there. Because they hate everybody. They don't want to give up the drug. They don't want to be there. The court told them this or six months in jail. I'll take this, but I'm going to raise hell while I'm there. Constantly stopping fights, people punching each other, telling me all the testimony, how to get out of there. They don't want to be there. They're not willing to give up the drug. So no program is going to help them. You can't force somebody to give it up. And they make sure we're going to raise hell in this place. I don't want to be here. And they say, as soon as I get out, I'm going to do drugs all over again. But they're there because jail. That, that's the only thing, you know. So people have to be willing. So just to close, remember, the authority that we have is always in Christ. If you're a believer, you have authority over the enemy. You should not fear them. You should not be afraid. You should not be panicked. That's a small thing. Jesus said, don't rejoice because demons listen to you. But rejoice because that your names are written in heaven. Now, can a Christian be demon-possessed? Absolutely not. Talking so about a Christian, someone that's born again, someone that has the Spirit of God living inside of them. Can someone who has the indwelling presence of God at the same time have a demon dwelling inside of them? Absolutely not. Now, can a Christian be influenced by a evil spirit? Absolutely. Can a Christian be under attack by demon spirits? Absolutely. Now, it can become a stronghold, like I said, if a Christian continues in persistent sin, they can give that demonic influence a stronghold in their lives. But for that spirit to live inside, that demon to live inside of them, not in a true belief. Why don't we stand as we get ready to close? Next week, Christmas Eve, I encourage you to invite folks to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And believe God, pray throughout the week, Lord, I pray that the sea will fall on good soil. So the kids are going to sing, and we're going to have a great time. We want to see people come to Christ. That's the, that's the desire of God. That should be our desire, people to come to Christ and, and repent of their sin and, and develop that relationship with God. Father, we just thank you, Lord, for this time, oh God. We can come together, Lord, as your church, Lord. Thank you for your presence this morning, oh God, Lord. That it's always, oh God, with us, oh God, Lord. Thank you for your word, oh God, Lord. You've given us all things that pertain, oh God, to life and godliness, oh God. Lord, we thank you that he who is in us is greater than he who is in the world, that you've given us authority to trample our serpents and scorpions over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt us. Father, we thank you that we're more than conquerors through him who loves us. Thank you, Father, that your spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Lord, we pray that we would exercise our authority that we have, oh God, that we would not allow a defeated, oh God, enemy with his demon spirit, oh God, to try to influence our lives, oh God. And when we're under attack, oh God, Lord, we pray that we would exercise our authority that you have given us, oh God, and tell them to lead in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Thank you. God bless, church. Love you.